Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast, formerly Amanda's Wellbeing podcast. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a lawyer turned nutritionist with a passion for learning about how to live a vibrant life through practicing mindfulness and meditation, eating a nourishing healthy diet and moving my body and sharing what I learn with you here on this podcast. In this episode, I'm going to give you a brief wrap up of my 70.3 triathlon race in Cairns on the 6th of June this year, including a few interesting facts about triathlon and my observations about women in the sport of triathlon. I assume most people have heard of the Ironman. It's a pretty gruelling race and a momentous achievement for anyone who crosses that line. It often represents months or even years of pretty intense training loads. The first Ironman was dreamed up by Judy and John Collins, a couple who moved from California to Hawaii in 1975. I understand that in order to settle a debate about which athletes were the fittest, a race combining the three existing long-distance competitions already in Hawaii, they were the Waikiki Rough Water Swim, the Around Oahu Bike Race and the Honolulu Marathon was devised. And in February 1978, the first Ironman race took place. And the rest is history. So the Ironman distances are open water swim, 3.8 kilometres, a 180 kilometre ride, and then a marathon, which is 42.2 kilometres. So that's a total of 226 kilometres or 140.6 miles. The first half Ironman, also known as 70.3, was held in England in 2005 and that was the result of the then Ironman CEO wanting to give athletes a more manageable distance than the full 140.6 miles so that they could race more often. So the distances are half that of an Ironman and that is open water swim 1.9 kilometres, 90 kilometre ride and then a half marathon of 21.1 kilometres. That's a total of 113 kilometres or 70.3 miles, hence the name. And there is a move away from calling the race a half Ironman because the 70.3 is a race in its own right. So who owns Ironman? Because Ironman, if you've ever been to one, you will see it is a big business. In July 2020, Advance, which is a private family-owned business that also owns Condé Nast and many other major investments, purchased the Ironman Group from Wanda Sports Group Company for US $730 million. As I said, it's a big business. The Ironman Group includes Ironman, 70.3 triathlons, the Rock and Roll Marathon series, the epic series of mountain biking events, and many more. Ironman says that each year over 1 million international athletes participate in an Ironman group race with hundreds of events across over 55 countries. I did my first and only other 70.3 in Cairns in 2019. I signed up for two 70.3 races last year in 2020, but both were cancelled due to the pandemic, so I ended up back in Cairns this year. I wanted to do another race because I was enjoying triathlon training and I also wanted to see if I could improve on my time. The main reason though is because I get a huge sense of accomplishment when I finish an endurance event like that. It makes me feel strong and empowered as though I can get through any of life's little and even large problems. Also training for me is like my meditation. It helps calm my mind and elevate my mood. With abuse and misogyny in Australian swimming being called out at the moment, and rightly so, it made me ponder the participation of women in Ironman and 70.3. I do want to be clear that I've neither experienced nor witnessed any of those attitudes in triathlon. In fact, quite the opposite. The sense of shared achievement and camaraderie between men and women is one of the things I really love about the sport. However, there is a participation gap. In the Cairns 70.3 race I just did, women made up 39% of starters. That's not too bad, but in the full Ironman, it was only 21%. My personal theory about why the participation of women is significantly lower than men is because women in relationships, and especially those with children, 
are more often than not taking on disproportionate physical and mental loads when it comes to running the household and arranging the lives of their families. In short, they usually have significantly more barriers in their way to fitting in training. As I said, this is only my opinion, but it is based on speaking with a lot of other triathletes. In other words, deep-seated changes in the division of household labour are probably required before the scales tip towards more equal participation. Training for an Ironman or 70.3 is a huge commitment, both time-wise and psychologically. It requires not only carving out the time, which for most people means training at times when their family or work doesn't need them, so really early in the morning, but also pushing yourself to get your set done, even when you don't feel like it. I'd actually be really interested to hear what anyone else has to say or observations about women's participation in sport, especially triathlon. Okay, so time for the wrap-up of my race. I have done the Cairns 70.3 before two years ago, as I mentioned, and that is an advantage because knowing the course helps with nerves a little bit, but I still felt anxious for the three days leading up to the race. My lead-up was not ideal. I had a chronic upper hamstring injury that inhibited my running training, so I tried PRP injections and a cortisone injection, neither of which provided any noticeable relief, unfortunately, so I had many, many visits to my physio, and that is, of course, one of the other hidden costs of triathlon, keeping yourself in one piece and moving. I also suffered from unexplained fatigue, and that too hampered my training. Anyway, I made it to Cairns. The conditions on the day were pretty good. It was warm, about 25 degrees Celsius, but not too hot. It can often be really hot in Cairns at this time. There were rolling waves and a noticeable current in the ocean, but for me, those conditions were pretty ideal for swimming. There was a strong headwind on the bike when heading south, and that was tough going, and it impacted my quads, which I really felt later in the run. So my day started with the first of four alarms going off at 3.30am. I made a coffee, packed my breakfast and walked down to the shuttle bus which took us from Cairns where I was staying to Palm Cove where the race started. So in Palm Cove when I got there it was still dark. I set up my transition one, my bike had already been transported there. I pumped up my tyres and then I put my wet wetty on. I ate my breakfast and I meditated for a while. Then I went and put my pump and street gear bag in the appropriate collection tubs. And by then it was time for a warm-up swim and to line up at the start as the sun rose. It's actually these moments between being ready to start and actually starting that I find torturous. I'm so nervous. I want to run away and cry and throw up all at once. So it's actually quite a relief when the race starts. So I seated myself based on expected time in zone two of four zones, and then off we went. I had a good swim, and note to self, next time I'll seed myself in zone one. As I ran out of the water towards T1, I stripped off my wetsuit, I ran to my bike, put on my shoes, helmet and glasses, packed up my wetty and goggles and stuff, and put them all in the transition bag. I grabbed a gel and ran to the mount line. The ride along the Captain Cook Highway is absolutely stunning. It takes in the magnificent Pacific Ocean vistas and all that FNQ lush tropical vegetation. I absolutely love it. So my ride was okay. I mentioned the headwind. My nutrition plan went well. I had a gel every 45 minutes, but I had two irritations. The chamois in my tri suit was rubbing into my upper thigh and it actually really hurt, but pretty much no triathlete is a stranger to chafing. And then my new drink bottle, which I'd mounted between my tri bars, rattled so loudly it was really distracting. I chewed a gel and tried to wedge it under the bottle cage, but that didn't help, so I had to press both of my thumbs into the bottle to counteract the rattling. Finally, off the bike after three hours and ten minutes and into t- and into T2, I did a pretty efficient changeover into my running shoes, but then I had to use the portaloo. So wrestling my tight, hot, sweaty, salty tri suit off and on again was like chewing toffee with dentures. Off I plodded, plod being the operative word on my run. I'm not going to lie, I pretty much hated every painful step of that run. 
Even though generally I would say I'm a keen runner, running after swimming and riding is, for me, another sensation altogether. So it was purely a mental battle just to keep going. But fear of failure is an excellent motivator, plus I knew I'd put in the training. So I slogged it out for just over two hours. Crossing the finish line is a feeling of almost indescribable joy and accomplishment. Is it worth the six hours of pain? In a word, absolutely. Overall, yes, I did beat my time from two years ago by 17 minutes. I was 107th out of a total of 363 women, but the only one that I really care about is my age group, and I came 11th out of 37 women in that group, and I was really happy with that. Would I recommend a 70.3? Yes, but you need commitment, good diary management, and most important of all, the support of your family. So thank you to my family who put up with their often exhausted tracksuit-clad mother for months. Actually, one of the best bits about triathlon is the war stories that you hear afterwards, comparing experiences with your triathlon mates. I won't name anyone here, but some of the stories I heard, which made my day seem like a visit to the petting zoo, were one friend doing a 70.3 swallowed so much seawater during the swim that she had to stop and vomit four times on the bike, but she still finished. A guy I met doing the 70.3 told me that he used to be overweight and a smoker, but he changed his life to set a good example for his kids and he finished the race with only minutes to spare before cut-off. Another one doing the full Ironman had pinched nerves in her feet that were so painful she pulled over seven times in the bike leg, but she finished it and in a cracking time too I might add. And perhaps the worst one, another friend doing the full Ironman got salmonella food poisoning days before the race. She couldn't eat, so she went in feeling really weak. She could hardly keep anything down during the race, but she finished too. Amazing. Stories like these, that's why I do it. The people you meet are truly, truly inspirational. I'd really love to hear anyone else's triathlon stories, so please DM me or email me if you'd like to share. So thanks so much for listening today. It would be great if you could share the podcast and tell your friends about it. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, that will help people find my podcast. If you would like to subscribe to Vibrant Lives Podcast, you can do that on all good podcast providers like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and also on YouTube please follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast. Thank you so much. Eat well, move well, think well.